So, um, any crews or equipment that need to be replaced is already built into that, whether it be a camera or a light bar. So that's part of that 50,000 would give us some wiggle room in there to make sure that there was enough to purchase any equipment that would be needed. So, for 2022, you see that the only thing there would be the final payment for lease number two and half of what would be the new cruiser for 2023. After that, I said, let's give the town a break this year and didn't put anything else in there. For 2023, it would be the second half of the cruiser and we would then purchase it if it was approved. And then for equipment, as you know, body cameras are becoming more and more popular in police work. They're very good for towns, uh, cities. Good, bad, or indifferent, they tell a story. And it may not be the one the police department wants, but that's, that doesn't matter. That's what they're there for, to tell the honest truth of what happened. Um, I would say that we should start thinking about it. Everyone around us is going to them. Um, Will is on the SWAT team. There's talk of them having to have them. So we do have the cruiser cameras already, but anything outside the line of sight of those cruiser cameras isn't caught. So go ahead. Can I ask you on that, as we really want to see the real picture, what do you feel that, is this really something under the police scrutiny and public awareness? Should this be really something we're thinking about for 22? Um, I appreciate you wanting to be sensitive to our budgetary needs, but in your opinion, who I would value more than anyone else, do you really think that can go another year? Or I was actually thinking forward? about it for this year. Okay, well, so, I think you speak to that a little more. I, I think the quicker we invest in them, the better, because we had a major incident in town, and we had an outside agency come in and look into that incident. And I think if we had the body cameras, for example, they probably would have paid for themselves right there. It would have told the story one way or the other. And you would have probably had to bring an outside agency in to even look at it. So, because the findings were great for us. My guys did everything perfect, which great for the, us in the department. But it still could have been right there from the get-go. And a lot of the scrutiny that came from that or could have been resolved right then and there if we could have had the footage. So that's why. Mm -hmm. And I don't to interrupt, I just I, I, I want to make sure I see the right picture. Is that do you really think that 2023 is the realistic picture? Or is that sort of you know soft selling it to us when really you truly think 22 should be the year? It would be nice to get them on board in 2022. Okay, and is there any thought to, and is this 25,000? How many units does that outfit? So we would need at least. The part timers could probably share a couple, but the full timers would all need their own, so at least. I'd say seven, seven to eight. And is that with the 25 buys? It's the storage. It's not the cameras. Oh. The cameras are relatively it's cheap. It's the storage of all the footage and how long you have to retain it. And um, for example, a simple motor vehicle stop, you may only have to keep a week. Uh, an arrest, you have to keep you know, for a certain number of time. Anything with the use of force, because of, of the potential of three years, you could be sued. You know, now you're talking about storing that for three years. So it's the storage that really gets you. So there really is no way, and I don't mean to interrupt, I don't mean to monopolize it, but so there really is no way to, to, to soften and spread this over two years. It's either 25 this year or 25 next year, is, is what I'm hearing, is that correct? Well, we could certainly split it in half and do 20 or 1250 this year and move to have them purchase for 2023 with the other 12 and then get them right on the street. So the storage is on premises. No, it would be off site. So I don't think that would qualify for CIP. That's that's a it's not a piece of hardware, right? Well, I think it's more, you know, the equipment fund rather than the CIP fund mm -hmm. potentially. Oh okay. And you had it marked. I have it under the okay. equipment. Gotcha. And would that be a recurring annual fee? Yeah. You know, typically with storage. It that's... would. It would have to be built into the budget. So this, this 25 would get us off the ground okay. and get us going. And then we'd have to figure out what the yearly storage would be after that and add it into the actual police budget. How do you, do you store the, the dash cam? We do. Now? And okay. so what we do is we download them to a, it used to be through UNH. Yeah. So we had that great service. Um, I don't know what we were paying, but it was all <laughs> offsite. It was all CGIS compliant. 
we could call over and say, this incident took place on such, a, they could send it right back to us, it was great. They decided they didn't want to run the program anymore, and that left us with having to find a new way to store again. And right now we're doing it internally on our hard drives, okay. on our server. So, it's number there. so there are SIM cards in the cameras, and Sergeant Hancock takes out the SIM card, plugs it in, downloads all the footage, and then moves them to the files. And that's how we currently store it. Gotcha. But there is some risk that we have. There is a risk of loss. If we're sure. Storing, there, um, those cameras have gone bad. We've had them and lost arrest stuff that we needed. And we've had, then had to go to explain to uh, public defenders, defense lawyers, I'm sorry, the video's not there. And they go, yeah, right, what are you trying to hide? <laughs> you know? But it, it does happen. You know, technology and computers, it, it does. Um, if we were to lose one of the hard drives on the server, you're running a risk of losing it. That's over here. What is the ongoing operating cost? That I would have to research. So this was, it would depend on the amount of camera, the footage you're downloading. Um, yeah. There's a personnel cost associated with that too. So it takes time to go through and as you mentioned, different data has to be sorted for different amounts of time. Bigger departments have a full-time person come in and manage their camera programs. Uh -huh. so so something either he or I would have to handle as a supervisor. And for one person every day, it's not insurmountable, but it is. Time it's quite a bit more than we do right now. Time. Time. Yeah. Just the dash cam. Yeah, you just literally pull out the USB and plug it in. It downloads in 10 minutes or so. And so let's take it one step further. Does that mean we need to perhaps hire more for the police staff, an additional person to just maybe no, I can cough a little more. Or? So we hired an admin assistant, um, Katie Perry. She's the full time uh, admin in Barrington, and she currently does all theirs. So okay. she's already familiar with it, and she does an amazing job doing theirs. And she's able to pull it and get it all set, and that'd be something I'd task her with. And even if we went to full blown buying everything this year, that's something she could handle. She's already okay. trained in it, and it's great. Okay. Um, what it may mean is maybe we'd have to start giving her, instead of 12 hours a week, say 16 hours a week. That may be the cheaper way than hiring a whole new person to deal with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, just a point of clarification. When you said this year, you mean 2022 or 21? So right now, oh, well, Hence, Originally, hence I was. I had when I first became chief, Caroline briefly talked about it, but it just wasn't going to happen this year. Yeah. But if we knew that the money was going to be there for next year, we could actively start looking into this. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. So once again, not to put words in your mouth, but sure. you really feel this is an important thing for a 22, protecting ourselves, getting on board with what's happening. Yeah. I mean, I, I know you said 23, but you really want to say that 22 is... I would like to see us. Sooner the better. I just think it protects everyone. It protects the town. It protects the town's interest. It protects the officers. And if they messed up, it's, it's super easy to deal with because there you go. It's all right there. Yeah. There's no denying what happened. You don't have to justify it. If you say yeah. you think it's a 22 item... There's also right the right. recommendation of the consulting agency, MRI, mm -hmm. that, that we hired. That said... That we should have body cam. Oh, I didn't know that, yeah. that piece. It, in law enforcement, they're just, it's something that's, it, for 90% of the time, it actually helps. And, you know, for example, Ferguson, that was right there. There was no and if or thoughts about it. Well, the fact there was an incident. Yeah. You know, the fact there was already an incident. Yeah, it, it, it would have saved a lot of time and energy, I think, if we had that whole thing on camera. Okay. You know. 90%, 95% of our stuff is routine, no, it's what that one time that you do have a major incident, it's already paid for itself. That one time. Because that's all it takes. Thank you for being candid about that. Yes, no, I've, I've been very adamant about that since I took over was that this needs to be looked at sooner than later. So are we saying we're going to change the purchase target here to 2022 then, instead of 2023? I think we should. Okay. I think it wouldn't be responsible to not. Um, so no. that would make 20, uh, 22, 63,000 total yeah. by moving that 25. And that would actually clear up 
2023 to just the 25 for the cruiser. So that would cut that in half to uh, 25 total. And then 2024, and so the cruiser would be just 25 a year, as you see across the board. And 2026 actually has a typo. That should read 25, not 20. I apologize. I thought I caught them all. Um, 2024, and I'd like Sergeant Hancock to speak to this because he's our gun guru, but we need to start uh, replacing our handguns due to their age. And if you could give them. Yeah, so the department currently uh, possesses, I have to look at spreadsheet that I don't have in front of me, but somewhere between it's like 11 or 12 uh, handguns that we carry on duty every day. Every officer is issued one, um, and that's uh, is theirs during the course of their employment. Uh, the majority of them, minus two, were, were purchased back in the late 90s, I believe. Um, and the, we have two newer ones that were purchased uh, 2010 range. Um, so we have some that are old. Uh, now they still function. Um, I'm an armor for Glock pistols, that's what we carry uh, currently. They all function, they pass all their function checks, everything's good when you do an inspection on them. Um, the issue you run into is that they are older, they are aging, and they get carried every day, whether like this, um, snow. snow, cold, hot, uh, they don't get stored in a safe at night where they're not getting touched and stuff. Um, so stuff starts to degrade. Um, anything firearms related is a low frequency, high liability area. Um, we don't want to run the risk that something happens to one of these firearms when it's needed. Um, so therefore, we should be replacing them periodically. Most larger departments, and I, it's hard to find a comparable department to Rollinsburg, it's pretty small, and, um, but five, six year rotation schedule, it's kind of like a car. You buy it, you drive it forever, and then there's no real resale value at the end, or you buy it and you, you know, use it until you pay it off, and you say, I want a new one, and you turn it in, and you get you know, a half to two thirds what you pay for it, and you buy a new one. Um, so the ones that we have now, like I said, should be replaced. Um, they're old, and like I said, we don't want something bad to, to pop up, something to break, it's the, um, the parts fatigue and stuff like that. And they, although you can replace them, sometimes a, uh, a high level servicing like that, where you're replacing the majority of parts, is gonna cost more than purchasing new fire. So, so. Question, um, the firearms that you use, is this also the exact piece that you practice with, or is this a firearm that sits in the holster unless it's actually drawn in service on the job? Is this something that's fired regularly, or is this something that you may never fire for years? Right, so yes, yeah, so this, this, so like the one that I'm carrying now, the one he's carrying now, we shoot, I shoot mine probably more regularly than anybody for um, the SWAT team and stuff, so I, I have a lot more practice than most people. But this is the gun that everybody qualifies on a yearly basis. If they're going to go out and practice with it, they use this. Um, and it's, it's carried around on a daily basis. So um, it's not it's not baby. It's not like it just sits in one place. And, um, so they have some use. They, they, they have, have use, yep. Um, 40 to 50 hours a week, they're out of the elements. Yep. Um, plus practice, yep. plus actual fire. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, round count, the amount they're fired doesn't so, isn't, as huge of an issue like mileage on a car. Um, when you talk about fire trucks, how many miles do your fire trucks have? What does the Michael? Right. But they but they sit around, they get used, they don't necessarily drive a lot, but they age and they fatigue and so they're not they're not old with no use. They're old and they've been used their entire life. Yeah, they, yeah exactly. And we will get some sort of uh, trade in value for them. It's just unknown what that will be. So that would be 2024. Okay. And 20, I'm sorry. Can you, um, before we move on to the next sure. one, can you can you speak to buying a lot of them versus buying a few of them every sure. year? Uh, price wise, are you talking about price? You, um, benefits you, and drawbacks both ways. Why are you are proposing it this way as opposed to putting it in operating? So I've only been here one time through when I've seen these replaced. And the benefit to buying the large group was they were gonna give you the most bang for buck for the trade-in. Because they don't want just one gun at a time. They wanna see 12 to 15 come back. 
um, larger departments are turning in 40 to 50 at a time. So they'll give you better resale value if you, the more you turn in. If you just hand in, turn in two blocks, you'll be lucky maybe if you get 100 bucks a block for them. Mm -hmm. So that's why. The additional advantage to doing it all at once <laughs> is that um, you're getting a whole new pistol, right? So you're going to need to train everybody on it because we can't just give people these guns and say, all right, here's your, you're coming in for your shift for the week. Here's this new gun. Take it out in the street. Don't do anything bad with it, right? Um, because it's, it's going to be different. They're going to need to put a significant amount of rounds through it to be familiar with it before they should be using it in, um, in a law enforcement situation. Uh, so training, if you can get that done all at once, it's a lot easier than necessarily stepping it out, especially personnel-wise, where we don't have a dedicated training unit, let's say, where we have three people whose job it is to walk around and pull people offline and say, all right, we're going to go train today for your shift. Um, so if we can do that all at once on a weekend or whatever, it makes it easier. Um, the other thing is ammunition. So one thing that might be considered when we um, upgrade our firearms is changing the kind of ammunition we use just to keep up with, you know, these were purchased, like I said, like 20 years ago. So uh, technology has changed since then, and we might reconsider using uh, a different caliber of ammunition than we do currently based on various benefits, um, cost being one of them. So if we change the ammunition, we could sell off all the ammunition we have in stock now and get paid very well for it to purchase new ammunition. Um, if you step out that change and you're having to, to hold you know, warehouse both calibers for a time period, and there's also small risk associated with that that somebody says, oh, this bullet goes in this gun and it doesn't. And that's a little bit of a problem. And to add to that, that as long as I'm chief here, that won't happen. Um, every officer is going to carry the same caliber, same gun. And the reason for that is, God forbid we ever get in that gun fight, they're all interchangeable. So if I run out of ammo and he has a spare magazine, he can hand it to me and I can still use my handgun. So there, you'll never see a time where you'll have two different calibers. So is there any specific benefit to having them all of the same vintage, i.e. the same year? I mean, I understand a 9mm is a 9mm, but a 2012, 2021-9mm versus a 2023-9mm, um, is there any benefit to having them all the same vintage? Uh, I, I think Chief Dusham spoke to that the last time he was here, that it would be better if they're all manufactured the same year, they're all literally identical. And that's what I'm speaking about, is that way you know any officer can use that gun. Say again, an officer goes down and you need that gun, you can pick it up and it's still the same exact gun, same magazine, same ammo, everything's the same. They they fired on that gun. It may not be their gun, but it's the same gun they had. So it's always, everything's the same. Is that typical of oh, for town police departments always buy the exact same Nation model line. here? Yeah, you don't see and the you base. the entire force at once, everybody gets new, everyone right. gets identical. Yeah, you don't see the days of one's carrying a revolver, one's carrying a SIG, and one's carrying a Glock, those are long gone. Mm -hmm. yeah, everyone's the same now, and it's for those very reasons. Makes sense. So Darren PD just did this uh, not a year and a half ago. The entire, um, the entire department, they had um, old six-hour pistols, and they traded them in and got new six-hour pistols, but different model, and so they went through that. Everybody at once, we're going to train on it, the equipment's a little different. Um, so it's, it's a common thing to do, that it's a, a full, full swap, if you will. And this is not, nothing that we could coordinate the timing with another town to do a larger purchase to get a better price if us and Summersworth purchased at the same time a larger volume. Is that, is that realistic? So Summersworth and us, for example, don't carry the same weapons. Um, they carry Berettas. Uh, Dover may have Actually, Summersworth just bought new guns uh, one or two years ago as well. But most departments do it on their own because their life cycles are all different. And um, state police, for example, has SIG. Summersworth has Berettas. We have the Glock. I, it, it would be very hard to coordinate that. And I don't think you're going to realize the kind of savings that you're talking about okay. without okay. Um, If we were to buy, so you were part of a buying group like statewide. Um, maybe. That's different. So like the LA County Sheriff's Office, I think it was LA County, I've been separate and, you know, just bought new pistols for their entire agency. But that's like 50000 well, that's uh, right. So the difference between us buying 12 or buying, you know, 50, probably not going to be that much at a price point. Right. And, and finally, the last question, not to monopolize, but 
there's no state requirement that says you cannot carry a gun older than 20, 25 years. There's, there's no pressure state regulation-wise that says that these have to be replaced because they're not up in the 90s. No. This is more us for our own safety. safety. It's a safety and a liability issue. Sure. Because it's an old one. Which goes back to trying to protect the town from liability the best we can. Yeah. And yourselves. So 2025, this has been the one thing Chief Ducharme wanted and wanted and wanted, and I've left this in here. Um, I did take out 25,000 in 2025 for a fingerprint scanner. Some people like them. I'm very old school. I have no problems using the ink and fingerprinting people that way. Uh, the scanner we had drove me nuts. It never worked for me right. So I did take that out, but I left the portable sign in. And I still feel that it could do the town a lot of good to have this message board. It would allow us, for example, we're talking about a hurricane coming up here Monday. We could put this right in the parking lot out back if we want to, or at the transfer station, or at the fire department. And we could make messages for, you know, in case of emergency, use these numbers, or whatever it would be for the storm related. That's just a perfect example coming up of what it would be, one of the things it would be used for. Um, secondly, we're getting a ton of complaints about speed. Everyone wants our radar out there. And it actually just got stolen and we found it down in the woods and now we have to replace some parts of it. So they actually managed to get the wires off of it and steal it. So it would be great to have something like this. I don't know if any of you folks remember our old radar trailer, but we used to share it with five other towns and that was a headache. Every time we got that thing back, something was missing off it. And plus, we have to ship it off every other four weeks or so. Then it would be three or four months before we'd see it again. So this would be something that we could constantly move around town on our own, and it would always be here, and it would be ours. Um, again, speed's been a huge complaint. Um, part of that staffing issues that we're getting to, we're, we've got our guys hired, we just need to get them trained, but it is, Bear Road is morning hours, shipyard workers are flying through town. Uh, they're going to pay Clement Road. That's going to become a raceway, I promise you. It just is how it goes when you repave roads and things. They, they look great, but they start flying down. Um, we do our best to go out and patrol them, but again, with shortage and staffing, it makes it harder. So there is a lot of value to these. A lot of people think they have a built-in uh, radar that's catching you. So they think their picture's being taken and that we're going to be knocking on the door and speeds go way down when they see those signs out there. Can I ask you, the, the diff, I mean, I agree with you on the, and understand the, the speed management side of it. Mm -hmm. The message board piece of it, you know, what's that price difference between if you do just, you know, just the speed side of it and the message board? <coughs> because, I mean, on the message board, there's so many other ways to electronically, and sure. I understand there's probably a lot of people that aren't on Facebook or receive text mm -hmm. messages and stuff. Mm -hmm. but, um, what would be the, do you have an idea what the difference is? My guess would probably about $10,000. Cheaper. Yes. It, so the, the 15 grand would be just for the speed management piece? Okay. About that. Yeah. I haven't checked to finalize the number, but I certainly could and get back to you. There's no kind of state grant money or anything like that? Well, there, it, it's from year to year. It depends what the feds are doing. Sometimes there are and sometimes there aren't. Last time we looked into this, we actually could get a half match, but that was two years ago and it got cut out. So I would have to go through if we are going to purchase it and see what was out there that year. But you're comfortable with the year of purchase that's that year? Yes. I mean, ideally, everything else being in the game. Right. In the game. Now, for example, I mean, on 236, because I drive that way a lot, I always see the one with a very polite machine when I do the speed limit, and <laughs> which is not good. But that, I mean, to me, that's a very effective thing, because yes. even I'm lead-footed sometimes, I see it in a reminder to slow down. Um, that, is that the kind of machine that would be in addition to the message board, or is it, is it like one unit, or is it just basically two separate So things? it's one unit, so you can use it either as the radar, or you can use it as the message board. Mm -hmm. So um, all over Dover, you're seeing them right now. With the, they were using them for the water drought. They were using them yeah. for COVID. So they were using theirs more as the message boards. Oh, that, that's the big. Yeah, this is a, yeah. that's a big. Yeah, yeah that's okay. the right? Versus yeah. the one on two thirty six. Exactly. Probably, you know, yeah, and that's the one we used to have. Yeah. That we shared. Okay. But this is 
this is still a trail. This is not a fixed unit anywhere. Correct. That will still you can still move it wherever you would like. Um, we actually borrowed one from Lee a couple of years ago, and we had it out on Route Four. If anyone remembers seeing it, it was pretty good size. Mm -hmm. So that's what it would look like. It would look like you have a um, Okay. <laughs> So that would be the only thing I put in for uh, 2025. And then looking down at 2026, we start to get into computers. And so we currently have four mobile data terminals, or short MTDs. And those are the ones that are in our uh, cruisers. So they're probably about the size of this actual screen, maybe even a little smaller. But that's what we run all of our motor vehicle checks for. That's how we connect to our dispatch. And the officers can basically do almost everything without even using the radio now by just being on those. And that is something that has cut down a lot of the radio traffic when you have nine counties, I'm sorry, one county, nine towns, all in one frequency, trying to talk at once. So in 2026, those will become eight years of age. And if Anyone, which we all do have computers, between Windows being discontinued, computers just age, that would be about the age where they would start to need to be replaced and age out. So we're looking to do that in 2026. So you said that um, you have four others. We have four total. You have four, so this is one of four. No, this would be for all four. Oh, I see. Okay. So we bought them all at once, so they're going to age out at once. So is there a reason with this that you're not putting them in the operating budget and just always have every year there's a new one, and every so every year you buy one and rotate them out that way? Um, we probably could do that with the equipment line, but uh, the reason Chief Ducharme had this in this way was because they're all purchased at once, so he was going to rotate them all out at once. So if we're going to do that with the equipment line, I'd suggest that we start moving them out probably next year if we're going to do that. Because by the time you would get to 2026, I mean, you're looking at four years down the road, so that'd be the fourth one. But that's a possibility. I mean, the equipment line could probably hold one a year. I mean, I, I think that makes more sense, starting it right away and spreading it out. Because this... this I thought for SIP we had like a ten thousand dollar. Well, we do. That um, yes, it has to be over ten thousand dollars. But then again, we're keeping track of these equipment items now too. So on the one hand, it's a way to keep track of equipment. Oh, I see. This but on the other hand, right? You, you know, it, it doesn't it, it kind of rise to that level. So so that's why I think it kind of makes sense to put it in in operating. We don't have all the laptops on this. It's kind yeah. of like we really need a whole other plan for equipment and things like um, the laptops and the, mm -hmm. and the printers that went home with people who went working from home. Um, I also have one to fail independent of the other three. And if you know, we were buying a new one, we could always just get in the habit of retiring the one right. or spend the least least satisfactory performance on it. But yeah, you're right. They do get old, they get slow, they get faulty. Right. Um, if there was a new one coming in every year, um, you know, just forward thinking, because obviously these are all the same age. Right. For example, this year I could purchase one and look out of our equipment line and rotate it out starting this year. So. What are your thoughts on that? I, I'm actually okay with that. So is that something we want to look at for a change on the CIP or how we handle that? We can do that. I think that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, so the per per unit is. Looks like it's like under two thousand dollars to yeah. replace one. Yeah, they're about fifteen hundred. Kind of yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's more because they're tough books, sort of, okay. because they're in the cars. So again, now unlike your normal desktop, these are getting below twenty overnight. You know, hundred degrees all summer. So that's they're built for that. So that's why they're on the pricier side. Plus all the banging around and everything else. But it's not a significant amount, even two thousand yeah. dollars compared to what we look right. at for the CIP. That's not. Yeah. So I'd be fine. So I'd leave two thousand twenty-six blank then, at this point. Doesn't mean I won't figure out some need for next year. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait. But at this moment, I would take that out. Yeah, I'd be okay with that. 
2027 and 28. So what I wanted to do was I, I met with Tom Lavelle, who is our IT guy for the town. And this year we're lucky that we do have some extra money in the budget because we need to replace the server this year. So it is going to have to come out of my operating budget, but we'll be able to do that. But he told me that servers get six years and that's just being safe because you don't want to lose all that stuff that's on the server. So I thought of, I presented it to split it into two years, put half away in 27, and then the other half in 2028, and purchase it in 28, and that would make the server six years of age. So that's why it's split into those two years. But just to correct you, we have a single server. We have no redundant backup server. If the server fails, we, we're in a very bad situation. For our local stuff, yes. So our IMC, which is what we run for our police records, is through Stratford County Dispatch. So everything in IMC is actually backed up through them and whoever they pay the backup. But all of our local files, all of our photos that we take, and this is again what we're shipping off to UNH until they said no more. So yeah, if our server fails, that all goes with it. Has, has the tech guy talked about you know, using you just read it in the press all the time about mm -hmm. AWS, the Amazon cloud service, and, and it's really not even just for the police department. It could be for the town. I know you use like Google Doc, which is for Google Drive, which is okay, but something a little bit more stronger has all the backups. Mm -hmm. It's not our headache on a day-to-day -day sure. basis of having to do this. It, you know, is, is that something the town would look at and to say, here's how we want to solve our server problem across? So, so separate and apart from the police issue, we do have a file storage problem, which is not so much about capacity, but it's more about functionality. So it is something that I think ought to be looked at, I think, through a subcommittee in moving away from Google into another alternative. But what I'll say about Amazon, though, or what you have to be careful in doing that, particularly with police records, is... Um, maintaining both security and confidentiality, right. um, which is not necessarily something that, I don't know how Amazon um, addresses that, or maybe they don't. Google, we don't have a regular Google account. We have a different Google Apps for government level of Google that's separate from like a private Google account. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Amazon offers that level of service, but yes, I think I mean, large across companies, town we ought right. to be looking yeah. at this. Large yeah. companies run their businesses on it. Yeah. So, so that's, 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 really, have to be that's my day job is, is IT, so okay. AWS has a public sector government cloud. It's a completely different data center. It meets all of the requirements. The problem that the town is going to run into is, is the data fees for that. Mm -hmm. Which are, very, very unpredictable, mm -hmm. and for a town that likes to budget and have fixed costs, depending on how much those files are accessed, you know, for every gig up you pay a certain amount, for every gig down, for every time you go into it, there's all kinds of additional fees mm -hmm. that you get hit with, um, but, you know, like you said, you don't have to worry about backup, you don't have to worry about you know, replacing servers, they do all that, you know, magically in the background. Um, it's just a cost issue that's yeah. usually what I'm seeing as customers are moving away from, moving everything to cloud, and moving more towards hybrid applications that have to be in the cloud are staying there, mm -hmm. but the data they're moving back on prem because it's yeah. cheaper. cheaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For example, that goes back to those body cams. Again, it's the storage where they get you. They'll, get, they'll give you the cameras nice and cheap and give you this big spiel and then they hand you the bill and go, here's your storage bill. Yeah. <laughs> but for us, we do have to meet those higher requirements for safety of all that confidentiality. And we are, Tom and I have talked about trying to find another place like the program UNH was offering, but we haven't found one yet, for the price anyway. Because as Sean said, I mean, they're poo poo bucks and UNH was actually giving us a pretty fair price. And they had met all the state requirements and everything for the CGIS for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just seems I know the county does a lot of stuff. You know, Carolyn, you and I have mm -hmm. talked about some of the things they do with mapping and what's out there and some things. I mean, it'd be a great thing for the county to kind of have a service across the, especially in so many small towns, mm -hmm. just come up and say, 
Well, we can do this effectively for you. Yeah. We can have the whole buildings do it. But. It's interesting you say that. Um, our county IT has been hacked twice with that ransomware and left us down for weeks at a time. So, <laughs> and when, when they tried to sell us, when the sheriff's office in the county tried to sell us on the idea of coming back live to them, it was, you won't have any problems, you won't, you won't get hacked, the security's going to be great, it's going to, anything's hackable. They yeah. got them literally twice already. Wow. And it's cost the county a lot of money to get that stuff out of there. And again, departments, weeks at a time, we weren't able to access our program that we used. Mm -hmm. So that's why we still like having that inside one mm -hmm. to protect it. A, a current server code, the police are you talking about, what's the year of that? It is about six years old. That's why it needs to be replaced this year. Okay. Great. So unfortunately... Oh, so um, that's why you're looking at 28 for the next... Right, six okay. years old. Oh, okay. So I did not do... Chief Ducharme did the budget going into 2021. So he had not put that in there. But we're again, we're able to find that in there. So it'll be okay. So, but I just want to make sure in 2028, I had enough money to prepare for that. Yep. Six years is actually outside of industry norm for a critical server. Three and years. is that wise to expect that lifespan out of it? Is that, is that if you look at wise? the industry as a whole, three years mm -hmm. is the recommended life cycle. Three. Yeah, on anything like that because you start seeing hard drive degradation, you start seeing components fail, you know, they, they run all the time, right? They suffer through the power fluctuations and, and all of that. So once you get past that, you, you run the risk that something bad happens. And it's not like, you know, I worked for a healthcare and you know, we had 150 servers. One went down, it was very easy for us to just move stuff around. They, they don't have that here. But that's something you can review over the coming years. You sure. decide it's not a 28, it's more of a 25 or 26. Right. And where we just took that 7,000 out of the 26, maybe something, and speaking with Tom, we could move to our 26. So that's not related to 19. Yeah. Okay. And then our computer network. So again, these were all bought at the same time, and again, with Tom's expertise, he's saying about a 10-year lifespan, so 2029 would be that 10 years. So that is all the computers downstairs that the patrol use, I use, the admin help use. So that's one, two, three, five, nine, give or take. Nine computers that would have to be replaced. And if you accounted for the inflation, inflated price when we gave this 20, is yes. that something? So that should get us That's through with the well uh, cost in that year? Eight computers would need to be replaced, and that's with all the hardware. Mm -hmm. so, so you're suggesting a 10 year lifespan for a computer. I, I would suggest to this group that you put it in operating budget. And even if you replace one a year, you're out to eight years. And I would even suggest that eight years, you're past industry standard for a computer. So I would say maybe put it in operating budget two a year, so that you've got a four-year lifespan. I would that too, just like what you said. I think six years is probably a little unrealistic. That's really crossing the fingers for a long time. Well, Written it over yeah. it makes me nervous. I, I think it's a little bit of culture of Rollinsford to try to get the best lifespan out of yeah. everything, which is admirable, but it's not always, you know, at some point when it's critical infrastructure, it's going to bite you. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, it's not realistic. And I think they're kind of building technology, so it's less likely to live as long. Right. Yeah. And just like the uh, MPD, I, I think in that operating line, there is probably room to grab one at least once a year. But if you put it in operating, then, then you're level funded. Sure. Um, and, you, and you do small increases with inflation, mm -hmm. but you're not. Because to my mind, if, if, you, if you buy a bunch of technology at one point in time, then you're going to be spending a ton of money again at a point in time. Whereas if you're always revolving, there's always, you know, you're never that, you know, behind the eight ball with right. technology. But you're constantly refreshing your yeah. inventory too. I think there's some value in that. Well, and there's a support cost. So 
you figure you know an IT tech makes you know seventy five to hundred dollars an hour. Once you get past that three to five life cycle, if they're coming in here and spending two to three four hours a you know a year on that, you're almost paying for a new device in that. So you get the latest software, you get the latest antivirus, malware protection, all of that, and you buy a new computer. It just makes makes sense that for a wire. But that's also something you can you just have to operate. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so okay. yeah, I'm fine with looking at that version of doing that as well. And actually I like the idea. Um, a lot of this stuff was already in here that I left. So uh, radio system. This one thing. So Carolyn, so the computer network for the source would go to equipment instead of CIP? I'm, I'm suggesting neither and just put it in the operating oh, budget and leave it out of this spreadsheet altogether. Say, for example, back up that line I was talking about, the equipment fund, something like that. Yep. So then, the last two things that I have are 29 and 30. And that is our radios. And there is a need for these to all be the same because, again, they all go through strap or dispatch currently. I mean, who knows in 2029, we could be at Dover State, who knows? But for the moment, they all go through strap or dispatch. And they're all programmed the same way. So it's very important that each radio still maintain that sense, just like a handgun sort of, that sense of it matches each other. Um, you don't want officers getting in four or five different cars, and every time they get in, something's different. One thing I do is I always set the equipment up in the car the same as the prior year and the prior year and the prior year. Even if it's getting rotated out, that new car equipment is set up the same. So that way, again, an officer, it just becomes muscle memory for the officers of where everything is. That's the same need for radios and things like that. And it sounds silly, but it really is. Um, you don't want them to start using two different portables because one day this one's available, one day this isn't, and they don't match. So that's one of the main reasons for that. And what's the age of the radio that you're currently using? Right now, they are about probably five to six years old. Okay, that's, what's a, we talked about realistic lifespan. What's, what's a realistic lifespan? I think they can last that long. Yeah, just like anything else, we've had to get some repaired, and they have two-way has the parts for them, and we send it down, and they fix it. And, but they get bumped around a lot, just like the the base radios in the cruisers don't get as hard worked on as the state portables. They're the ones on the officer's belt, always bouncing into things or out the elements or things like that. So um, then, in 2030, the of the 20,000 would finish replacing and the remainder of radios. So we do it in two halves. Maybe by the, and by the looks of the way this was set up, I'd say the 10,000 would be probably the base radios and the 20,000 would cover all the portables. And that would conclude what I have. papers in front of us, Sean with his expertise is going to be able to put it up here in a PowerPoint. Uh, and I know it's going to show a couple of changes on board there from what we're seeing in front of us. Uh, we adjusted a few things by doing a little bit more uh, research. We'll go at it from there. And you see with our stuff, big money to replace up all of our stuff obviously. And we have uh, gone way out and put them all in there. 
But that's what we requested. That's exactly what you requested. So even though we have a new fire truck that we've had in the station now going on three years, we still have that in here for replacement. Ooh, way out there. Um, big item. So, but every piece of equipment that we have as far as our vehicles is all on board here. Everything is included. We've spaced them all out. There's nothing right now um, uh, that needs replacement immediately. Uh, engine 1, I think we got five, five years out is when engine 1 comes. And we had made that talk before with China. Um, things only have, uh, this town has a history of trying to milk every last little bit of usefulness out of anything that at home. The last fire truck we had, we kept it for 30 years, which was way beyond it, what its lifespan should be. Normal lifespan for a major piece of fire equipment like that is 20 years. Most fire departments will replace them at that point. And right now, the engine that we're looking at replacing down the road in a few years is already at 20 years old. So we're back on borrowed time again. But again, that's, I just kind of wanted to go over that overview of it as far as you look out. Like, we've got the tank truck up there, the command car we've had for four years, but we've got everything included in there as far as our large purchases as vehicles go. Some of the rest of the things is uh, included with station maintenance. And this is something else which we've uh, we brought up and, and kind of added to the list. And again, some of this is COVID related. Uh, why we wanted to uh, include this, because this is not on the list in front of you. Um, with COVID hitting, well, let's go back one step. Our equipment is a 10 year lifespan for turnout. Gear. So when we purchase it, whether it sits on the rack for 10 years or it gets, uh, a guy is very active and gets used an awful lot, after 10 years, it goes away. Should we have an incident uh, where somebody gets hurt or injured or killed, all that equipment is taken away and it's included in the investigation until they determine what the outcome would be. So our problem is, um, Sean and I discussed this many times, is we're a pretty transient organization in the fact that we have 24 members roughly, but out of that 24, we may have 10 of us that are very active. I have a hard time buying a set of equipment for somebody which costs minimum of $3,000 to equip one firefighter for somebody that's only going to show up for 10 calls out of 200 a year. I have a hard time trying to justify that in my mind, never mind coming in here and asking for that kind of time. So we have plenty of gear, but most of it is outdated. Um, with COVID, the companies that make the gear, Globe is the, is the big one that's in Pittsfield, they completely shut down. They did not make any firefighting gear. They switched over and made masks and gowns and stuff to help fight COVID and even more of the uh, medical side of things. So with that being said, we lost um, our program to try to replace some. Basically in our operating budget is where we try to, try to include some of this money. And we got it to uh, be increased over the last couple of budgets is we got it up to $8,000. And we would use that on an annual basis, and we have a list here, and I keep it with what the guy's needs are. So we're able to replace roughly three pieces, three ensembles every year. We lost that with the two years here recently with COVID. So we've fallen behind six sets already. Um, and, the, and the other problem with it is when we bring somebody in, we've got an outfit them, it's a new guy, we hire him, send him to school, and we hope that the next guy that comes down the road when he's done, because we don't have him very long, is roughly the same size, so we can reuse the gear, but that's, that's kind of a fallacy, it's kind of a hope, it's, a, it's just a big wish. So we're kind of behind between the, uh, the hard ball and the hard place on that one, so Sean did some looking. This is basically what an ensemble for a firefighter looks like right there. I mean, we've all seen it, but we've got it broken down into a little bit more information. I'll let you carry the ball from you, Sean. Yeah, I mean, you look at it, you know, pants, coat, boot, and hats. It is what's required for everyone. There's there's gloves, there's a hood, there's there's different things like that that are kind of expendable items that, that get replaced a lot more often because they get used. Um, but right now the, the latest quote we just got was thirty seven hundred dollars for that complete set. We currently have yeah, go ahead. so and you had said for the two years you were unable to purchase because there was no manufacturing of those items. Is the money that was initially planned to be spent to buy, purchase those items in those years, is that still available unspent? No, because uh, we still filled it in, as Sean said. We might, we could get a helmet, we could get boots, because I have guys that things are going to wear, and i got to go buy this stuff now. The hardest two things to get 
were a jacket and the pants. Okay, so that equipment line, even though it's there, we, we were utilizing that to get other components, which we still need. So there's no one spent money. Right. Okay. And that was in the operating budget. Okay. So right, whether it be gloves. Okay. I mean, just, just a helmet right there is $400. That set of boots is three hundred dollars. So, um, you know, I get guys that come in. You know, I, you know, I step on a nail in a building fire or something, and all right, we got to get you a new set of boots. So, it's still, even though I say I got eight grand there, I can try to get three sets. It gets whittled down with some of the other components that you need to get replaced. Or if we have, you know, something happen and we need to get gear repaired, you know, when they send it out to repair it, it's three four hundred dollars usually to repair it. And, you know, we can only get two sets anyways. You figure 24 members, we're looking at 12 years if we replace on time. And that's it. Nobody changes sizes, nobody, <laughs> you know, nothing happens that, that kind of takes that away. Um, so. And again, since we're, we rotate through people so quickly, the other thing which has changed for us is we still have to get everybody certified at level one and level two cert uh, certification for a firefighter. Those programs themselves were shut down for a couple of years, just like schools where everything else we couldn't get large groups together to educate these guys. Those are starting to open back up. But in order to go to the schools, I can't send a firefighter to school and say, well, we'll squeak them by with a helmet that's 11 years old. Because these schools now, there used to be a loophole here and there, you might be able to stretch it out a little bit, those are gone. So when a, when a recruit or a, somebody that's coming in for training, cannot walk into any classroom or any practical exercise unless every bit of your components of your ensemble is 100% within the dedicated time. And we're constantly juggling what we have, trying to do that. I've had guys that come in, I can get them into a school at a discount, but my gear's out of date. All right, this guy doesn't show up enough. Take his gear, because his gear is, is a little bit newer. So we're constantly shuffling that around, and, and it becomes an issue. It really does. But now with the training picking back up, and I've got a couple guys I have to send in the spring. Right now they're using gear that's out of date, so I have to do that shuffle the cards. Yeah. And, and I, am I correct in assuming that out of date gear is worth absolutely nothing? Um, no it's, value. It's, to it. Well, yes and no. What happens if we have if we go to a building fire and everybody gets completely trashed? The gear has to be washed and clean before we can reuse it. So we got to get all that debris off because that's just a kind of citizen waiting to happen, a cancer issue. So what we will do is we'll take some of the older gear that's there, it's spare gear, so I can at least keep these guys protected if I need to use them again on another incident. Just have to be very careful on exactly what their task is going to be on. But there's no recouping any money on a sale aspect like the old guns no, no. that she's talking no, about. There's no monetary value to be gained. Help offset no, nothing. No, 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 no
that hey, we've ordered this stuff and we just haven't get it. I mean, there is some argument you made. Yep. That, uh, it's there. As long as it's ordered, it, it, you're just simply waiting. You've done your due diligence. To exactly. We so recognize the problem. We're working to get to it. We just got to wait for delivery. Yeah, that's like that. Like, I'm sure we all face that when we order something somewhere. And I tell you, you know, your new couch for five months because they got to go. This is the same thing. So what I'm hearing is that this is really an assessment because we're so outdated in some of the equipment. This really is a, a mandatory 22 thing. Yeah, we are right there. We really should be put that in there. Yeah. And this just catches us off. Understand that I have another 19 set sort of here upstairs. Yep. It is three to 10 years old. So if a new firefighter walks in tomorrow, the, they're using that little gear. This is a three to ten years old past the ten year. Past the ten years. So it really isn't equipment there. I mean I know it is out it's an ensemble, but it really isn't because it doesn't qualify. But that is correct. Yeah. But we, we put them in something so if we get a new guy before he goes to school, gets trained, we still use utilize him. We want to work him into the system, understand what he's getting into. I mean we can take him on traffic action and train him how to do traffic control. That's I mean, not that's it, that's it not gonna roll of the dice though. In, in some I mean, cases, it is. Knowing when putting a person I in totally hazards, understand. And, and I'm not, I nope. know it's what we have to do, yeah. but so in this bigger what, picture, we're knowing. That's what we manage every time, is we have to do that. Every single time. Any call, any call that we have. He has to look at who comes in, I look at who comes in. New guy, old guy, experienced guy, driver of this, every single time. We try to fit him in the proper position so that we can handle whatever the call is. As responsibly as we can with it, something like that. Yeah, 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 you go. The, the, the chief's in 16 year old gear because he makes sure the rest of us all have a new gear. I have not updated my gear since I left the Dover Fire Department. I still use that because these guys are going to the building. But you need to tell us that that's not a good idea. I mean, it's not a good we idea. Don't, we it's, don't want to jeopardize It's the worst either, thing. Right? But I'll go in if I had to go in and help with a rescue or a firefighter down or something like that. That's not my job. My job is outside managing the scene, running around a building, calling what help I need. Assigning people what task needs to be done. Right. So, my mindset, probably 100% wrong, is no, I'm not going in on a have to basis. I'm going into if I need to basis, which is the difference. So, See, I, would say it's just the I, I hear it from him all the time. Yeah. He, if he's going in, it's because he has to. Perhaps hit the fan, and he's yeah. going in to try to help rescue somebody. Yeah, we're talking in life. Day. Day. We're talking a matter of life. And to me, that's you want good gear. And it sets a bad. Well, I don't want our fire chief going in there and his updated equipment that's not in his life. Go there. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is where I protect the uh, protect yeah. Uh, number two, uh, vehicle exhaust system. So, cancer is the leading cause of death and illness in firefighters today. You know, many years ago it used to be heart attacks that killed firefighters. Now, if I go two weeks and I don't get some kind of hey, we're doing a fundraiser for you know, brother or sister firefighter that has cancer, it, it, it's a shock to me. And currently our station has no way of capturing any vehicle exhaust. Every time we start a truck in the station, not only does it contaminate the air in the station, it contaminates all of our equipment, all of our turnout gear, everything. Um, so the, the second thing that we put on there uh, for $75,000 it is a vehicle exhaust capture system. There's two options for that now. You're probably all familiar, you've seen the hoses hanging down that connect to the exhaust pipe. Um, they're a great system. They're very prone to damage and to failure because what happens is over time, the boots that go on the mufflers don't detach. You drive the truck out and you drive it to whatever car you're on because it didn't detach and you can hang money to fix that. The second picture that you can see down the bottom is, is that they've now made large vacuum systems that sit in the station and suck all of the air in every time you suck, every time you start a vehicle. So the sensor that when you open the door, it kicks on and creates a vacuum, filters all of the air, and removes the contaminants. The good thing for us is, is it's a little bit less expensive up front and the long-term maintenance of them is also lower. So $75,000 is what it would cost to be able to equip the station with that. It would be one on each side of the station. If you're familiar with the station, you'll brick park, and then you addition 
each would have uh, its own component. And I understand that the vehicles are all kept in a heated building, but is, is there also block heaters on these buildings, on these in engines to keep them up to temperature? So, so if you do start it up and pull it out, it still needs to basically warm up the fluids and all so there is a, there is a bit of an I, I stand emergency dictates how quickly you leave, but um, they're not turnkey and out to go down the highway. There's still a period of time that you allow them to run, whether it's indoors or outdoors. There is a period of time. We try to get them to put it on a ramp, obviously. Yeah. Of course, unless it's 20 degrees below zero, then we kind of want to get it out the doors close to the heat in the building. But there is no block heaters. None of them have that stuff. So basically, it's whatever the main, whatever the building heat is maintained at. And it's usually 60, 65 degree ranges. So is there any benefit to have a block heater to have the fluids already up to temperature so literally it's hit the key and you're down the highway? Is there any benefit to that? Um, not so much an emergency fire apparatus like that because you just still cannot, um, the time wise, I know what you're saying, you got to get you know, you a temperature the air and that's already up. at temperature. You gotta have, yeah, you got to have Yeah, pressure. Um, basically um, I have some, some individuals like that who service fire trucks, that's their job, they work on it. And they say it's just one more component that becomes more of an issue. One more thing that goes wrong, and when those things go wrong, they become very expensive. And nothing really to gain by using Nothing to gain by putting anything like that in. A lot of those block heaters are things that might come outside, and you need to maintain something like that where they're plugged in. Yeah. But we can control that being on the inside. inside. It's really not uh, as beneficial as you might think it is. I'm just looking at the inside. I totally understand. I, I know you let the air know, My office sits right behind where the engine sits, so I, I get it every time. And I'll follow up on that question. I'm looking at the 75 up there, but I'm also looking on what you're looking at for CRP. And I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a $20,000 uh, disbursement in 22. And if I go over, it looks like NCIP reserve fund currently is 30. Am I reading that right? For a total of 50. The very top line says vehicle exhaust system for 2022. They were looking at a disbursement of I mean, is, is 20, and then going across the line, I see NCIP reserve fund. I see 30 there. The rest would have to come from taxation. So, so it's um, it's showing green twenty thousand yeah. dollars. So, in other words, in according to this spreadsheet, you would need to put twenty thousand dollars in in cash or in the Warren article that puts money into the fund. Twenty thousand dollars is dedicated to that item. And then once you do that, you only need to find ten other thousand dollars because there's already thirty in it plus the twenty you're putting in for that year right. to meet the sixty. So but the sixty, 60 and then that's seventy-five. Right. So now you're finding twenty-five instead. Okay. So that there is a price adjustment from what we anticipated in previous years. The systems have gotten more expensive. Exactly. Everything has, right? And, 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 then, right. Right. and, and I understand that. Truck. I just I didn't yeah. know if I was missing fifteen thousand so, so, somewhere. You know, the bolt we got. Last year was 65, and they've already told us to go up on that. And the 75 that you're talking about is that the better system that actually purges the entire building of air, or is that or is that a hose situation? No, that's so. Interestingly, that vacuum system is less expensive than the the plyno vent, the hose that you're used to, because the, the plyno vent there's a ton of insulation that has to happen. So each apparatus has to have a hose runway and an individual exhaust that goes back to the main fan. There's a lot of piping, there's a lot of manpower to do that. Whereas the overall vacuum it's like is a, makeup a single system. unit that just sucks everything out, filters it, and puts the air back. So it's actually less expensive to install. There's a maintenance piece where you have to change filters and things like that. But over time, when you look at the hose issues and all of that, it's actually a better. But it, it's, it's less, less money and more efficient, so it's really no green. And that's the 75 we're talking about. I mean, we would come down to that. That's much more user friendly. The picture on the bottom there, green fire truck, that gray box hanging there, is what it is. Yeah. I've, I've been uh, exposed to both of those systems for, for many years. and. Before I retired out of Dover, that bottom picture they installed that in that new North End station, and it was a night and day as far as how it works and its efficiency. So that's what we've looked at. The pricing which we've been, we've talked to the uh, company that's installed that, and that's that would work great. The hose is just cumbersome and labor costs as they are, and then parts and pieces because they're a building. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. 
I, I see the benefit of the vacuum system, but I would suggest it may be worth increasing the heat expense to the building when you're vacuuming lots of air in the winter as opposed to just the exhaust specifically. So just to be clear, the vacuum system works with multiple filters. So it filters out the contaminants and leaves the air. So it's the not. So it's not. The primal then actually does more external air exchange than the actual background system. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the wash area, this is actually um, more to do with the stormwater mitigation plan. Um, it's $25,000 to create a wash area. Um, I kind of showed a picture of the front of the station just so you guys get an idea. Every time we wash trucks, all the contaminants from those trucks yeah. sits in between the apron of the fire station and the road. That's supposed to be collected so that any oil contaminants actually get filtered out. And, and there's no place to do that. Um, in the past, we've been asked, you know, why don't we bring it down to the highway department? Why don't we bring it somewhere else? The problem is, is part of what we're also trying to do is remove salt, the road debris in the winter. So if winter time we go down to the transfer station, wash the vehicle, and then drive it back, we just cover it with salt again. And as the chief talked about earlier, we're running these vehicles 20, 25, 30 years. The, the rust and everything that the salt causes, we need to get it off to try to get that extra few years out of it. And we're okay as far as our this for stormwater. As far as, as far as stormwater is concerned, this has to be completed between now and the end of June next year. So so this has to happen. So that's what I'm saying. So 2013. I thought you said something the last time. 2023. This is, 23. It's, it's, this is so a 22 item. It's a 22. It has to happen now. Yeah, the good news that. around it is that we can use um, the, MS, the American Rescue Plan funds. It wouldn't have to come from CIP. Um, in other words, we can skip this whole spreadsheet where this is concerned um, and it would be payable through um, the federal funds, the big... Um, no town money? No town money. Yeah. At all? This is what the government... No, no, no match. match. No, the, the fund, we, we're getting $270,000, but it's very restricted and most of what it can be used for is um, water and wastewater infrastructure Perfect and stormwater. Um, so it qualifies for that, and not much of very anything else that, that we would actually likely do in Rollinsford. So it's a very applicable use. We just need to um, get it done. It, it needs engineering, potentially. Um, DOT says that we cannot um, hook into their storm drain system. It's a state road. so. So the original plan was to put an oil and water separator and the flows themselves would go into their stormwater system. They're saying no. So now we have to build a dry well or a tank or some other storage for the discharge of water and, and pump that. Um, and there's not really a place to do that unless we also extend the sewer line to the fire station and dig up the septic tank and then we can put that kind of structure with a septic tank currently. But there is significant funds, and this is a project that does qualify for use of So the whole funds. thing is essentially free to us, and we have $270,000, but the Water Sewer District also, of course, has an interest in these funds, most of these funds being for water and sewer infrastructure. Um, the town doesn't have water sewer infrastructure. The district does. The district doesn't have access to funds except through the town. So. Um, the, the, the district commissioners and the town select board need to have a conversation about the priorities of the funds, how to allocate them. But with, with the $270,000, we can certainly accomplish more than one singular thing. We just need to start having a conversation and get moving. But this is required. The district cannot deny us use of funds well, to, 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 to be clear, the support. select board decides the use of the funds. So, so the district can say we want to do A, B, and C, but the select board can say no. Right. Um, so, you know, to remain compliant with our EPA right. MS4 permit, we have to do this by June next year. So this is no longer really a CIP item. Correct. And we'll jump on. So, uh, the, 
the current generator at the fire station was not sized for the current load of electricity that we have there. So today, if Monday power goes out to the town and we're running multiple emergency calls because there's tree down all over the place, there is equipment that we can't run, like our air filling station, like our compressor with the generator that we currently have at the station. So 2024, we put in for a larger generator. This would be a 45,000 kilowatt generator that would be able to handle the full load of the fire department without us having to shut stuff down. And this is this is a price for for a unit that will hire the entire station, requiring no use of the current security of the current generator. So this would be there's not an option to investigate maybe getting a piggyback system so that. You put some circuitry and some equipment on the new piece, perhaps less expensive than this, and still use the existing generators in place? So the Can issue with that? talking to the electrician is, is that the way that these compressors work is it's the initial draw. So the, the easiest way to, to think about it is, is if you're at home and you, you know, plug your vacuum in and you plug your refrigerator turns on, your lights kind of go home real quick. It's that initial surge load that requires the generator of this size. So having two generators doesn't give us the ability to do that because it can't meet the surge load to start. Unless you split the loads at each panel and you have different panels, one panel off one generator, and one panel off another generator, so your overall surge is split between two each supported by a generator. Is that is that a possibility? Not not according to the electrician. I'm, I'm it has that. to be a 200 amp dedicated for this. And it would be expensive to, to start splitting up circuits, I understand that. And we asked the question of how can we do this, you know, can we do a dedicated generator just for, for the, you know, those components? And he said, the problem is, is that by the time you size for that, everything else that's running in the station is, is noise. It's the core. Yeah, it sounds like you're already Ask the questions that I was asking to him. So, we, so, I, so I always try to. I missed that. So the other caveat to this is, this would run all the operating needs within the department, but the fire station is also used as a, as a shelter. So if we had a large incident of people in the community that need a place to go, that's where the fire station comes for that. So we again need to have it powered up all the time for the so it'd be in the middle of a blizzard, or if we do get this. Tropical storm and people need a place to go. The fire station will be one of those spots. So that's one of the things that John's been dealing with here at Town Hall because this is also the same thing. But at least at the fire station, we have places where we can house them for probably a lot longer period of time than, than this building does. So that's the caveat for this to have one generator it does it all and it's up and running and it's covered two units. How long is the current unit? Uh, it's going to go on eight to ten years old. Yeah. And I'm assuming it's propane. And what's the what's the date for 2024? Is that just to put a target in and to try to spread stuff out? Or? So 2024 is the year that we would look to replace that. Yeah. And right. that year, yeah. um, so the 45,000 is to replace the entire generator. Right. Year. And so this is a new request, Carl. Because it's not on the list here. Correct. Correct. Okay. And the, the other thing is, if you were asked about, it would be. Powered by propane. Yeah. Last uh, year we redid the whole station. Your heat and, and we got yeah. two large tanks out back, and this sits next to that. So that's all in place. That we're gonna sense. Put it on the same path. Yeah. What is the lifespan of this? Good question. I mean, based on years, do you based on hours? Because there's a difference on each one. Uh, I would think you could probably easily get 20 years out of the generator for what I use. It goes on quite often. Uh, you'd be amazed at how often we do run off generator power. But the way the town electric comes into it, certain sections kind of freeze all the time, not a problem. But then you go through other sections, and it's completely dark. And we're kind of right on the middle of both of those. So it, it, it runs a lot. The big thing to remember is I've been here for several big incidents where we lost power. And this town of this size, Eversource doesn't care. I've watched for days of Eversource driving through, and you go, oh, they're here today. No, they just keep going. We are always one of the last ones that gets brought back. 
so there's been many times where it's been three, four, five. I think in one store it was up to seven days where yeah, the yeah, downtown. Yeah. I think it's density. I mean, not yeah. that many people get knocked out, even over by us. Gets knocked out, it's not that many people. Right, that many people are in business or something like that, they just yeah. the top right yeah. They just keep on trucking. The hospitals, you know, and all of those things. And you've been kind of, you've uh, anticipated inflation price. I mean, that 25 is realistic. I think mean, we're talking two or three years out. You still think that's a solid price? Based on, you know, it, it, the, the hard part is, is you know, traditionally you did 3% for a fire truck. The, the last few years we've seen closer to 10 percent so you, know, you can only build so much in in two years this is a reasonable number but if all of a sudden the generators just go crazy and people want to move off grid but okay. capacity wise you know capacity -wise, any additional increases in power need there that would require a larger generator if we need more than this it would require a whole revamp with Instead of a 200 amp circuit coming into the fire station, multi phase, you're talking a very large electrical. And that's not that. I, I don't see that as. I don't see you being able to do that. One thing I was trying to do for you was to make the fire department independent of these other departments around us. When we got that infilling station approved, it was just been installed last month. Uh, that's the last big piece of anything we're going to need that's going to be in the with a large electrical job. Where we are now is where we should be for quite a while. So we, we've kind of talked about this. Um, engine one is a 2001 Smeal engine with a 1,500 gallon water tank. Its expected life is 20 years. We're at 20 years this year. So you know we're expecting to replace it five years from now. That $700,000 number is 200,000 more than what we are 150 more than what we paid for engine two, two years ago. But like I just said, I mean, Summersworth just replaced one of their engines and it was $700,000. So that's, that, that's not even including inflation. When I figured, you know, 150 would be good. That's the number you need to see. And you, know, you could put a million dollars here. You know, if it keeps going $10,000 or, you know, 10% a year, you could realistically by 2026 be at a million dollars for a new fire engine. And, and you know, I'm happy to put those numbers, but um, you know, I'm hoping that it normalizes out to that three percent. But that's something to keep us updated each year. It, exactly. And, and that's why it moved to seven hundred this year. Right. right. So we have six hundred in it now and the year is twenty twenty six. That's and we know these numbers are scary. We don't enjoy cooking down either. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get a little bit of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. no, no. so, so part of the issue that we're starting to see is, is we're starting to have the fire engine, the motor, the drivetrain, all of those things don't get a lot of hours. It's the pump and the actual pipes. We're starting to see the pipes disintegrate. Mm -hmm. Um, I know Mark brought it into the select board meeting, but literally we had to replace a pipe like this year. The threads were completely gone off of it because it's water and the town water was acidic and it eats the metal in it. And you know, once it eats the, the actual pump, you, you can't you know, retrofit a pump in a fire truck that's 20 years old. And there's nothing that, that we can do. So. And, and unlike RSA's governing lifespan of ensembles, is there any RSAs that govern that says you cannot run a 25-year-old fire truck? What ends up happening is the town pays for it in other ways. So as the fire truck, truck becomes less, fire engine becomes less reliable, the insurance company starts looking at fire rating. And if the engine runs out of service for a certain amount every year because we've got it out for pump repair, out for that's what we get. And, and that would be much more costly than, than the end, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, ISO, which is the insurance service organization, they come in and they rate the town every 10 years. 
pays for that. Equipment, the water system itself, uh, manpower training, they get into all that stuff. And in reality, in our town, we should have a ladder truck sitting in our town. And if you want a ladder truck sitting up there, that would cost you a million dollars, easy. But we've been able to kind of fend some of that off because all of our mutual aid partners, we're ladder rich in the area, mm -hmm. between where we're, where we're at Dover. So, and they are so quick to get to us that they kind of, okay, we can give you that. But make sure you have two fire trucks that are ready to go, carry so much water, and can make up for some of that deficiency because that mill down there requires an awful lot. So that's where some of this stuff comes from. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I know the money and I understand the cost. And yeah, it gets scary. Yeah, we, we need real numbers, so that's, and that's, that's why I say no. And that's why, you know, I even put it right at the bottom, right? Yeah. The current replacement value is accurate, but, you know, based on the 5 to 10% we've seen recently, what the hell is going to decide whether we're going to bond it or the question whether we need to know this. Right. Right. And this one's showing some problems. Right. This is really right. as, as, as Sean said, it's having issues with the pulp. You see it every time we use it. But again, when we started the discussion, I was like, well, how many miles do we have in fire truck? It's not so much miles, it's hours. If we can drive, I think, 10 miles down the road. As an example, we took that over to Ark and Elliot like three years ago for our annual Ark party over there that we have. That truck sat and pumped for 22 hours straight. It didn't move anywhere. It drove five miles to Elliott, but it had 22 hours on all of the engine and the pumping section. So those are the things you have to look at. And that's why this one's starting to show some wear on those parts. Uh, so future considerations, I, I really broke it down into two things. Um, we kind of talked about the sewer upgrade. Um, it, it's not high on our priority list. We were having issues where two or three times a year we'd have sewage back up into the station. We've cleaned the pipe. We're pumping the tanks more regularly. We're not seeing that as a big of an issue. Um, but it is something that we kind of keep in the back of our head because we could see that again at any time. Um, if we build the wash area like Caroline talked about earlier, we're going to have to you know, utilize the area that the leach field and the, the septic tank are today, which would require, you know, some kind of connectivity or some revamp of the, the sewer system uh, out of the fire station. The other thing is, is because we are an emergency shelter, the system's designed for you know, two bathrooms. All of a sudden, that turns into a, you know a public you know, housing area those two bathrooms are going to get a lot more use than what would be, you know, the system would be designed for. So there would be a large benefit to the town of connecting it to the sewer and water uh, district. I mean, I, I think that makes sense. I don't know, I don't know if that 40000 was meant to say, well, that's what it would cost to hook it up to the town, but it just sounds like whatever the, if, let's say it's forty grand. It's going to make, you know, it kind of ties into the whole vehicle wash area to the funds available from the federal government. And it just sounds like the plan should be that would be a good solution as part of, you know, between these two things to put them all together. I didn't even think about the, the backup plan for people having a place to go safely. You're right. That if, you, if it's designed for 10 people, you know, all of a sudden you have 50 and they're there 24 hours a day and stuff. That could be a problem. Yeah, it, it, the, the fire station is not meant to be a long-term shelter. It, it's meant to be a short-term shelter. People can rally there, mm -hmm. stay there for a certain amount of time until buses can get there and we can mm -hmm. get them to a long Good. shelter. But you know, it, it's still in that time frame. You could overwhelm the system very easily. Sure. And that forty accounts for bringing it all the way out to the fire station from where it turns. So I don't know where, how far out there. The federal funds to accomplish this. So we can do it at the same time, or you know, I, it's kind of lofty to think that you can accomplish it at the same time as the vehicle wash station that has to be done by June next year to also do this at the same time and figure out, you know, that would require probably engineering from the district mm -hmm. and everything. So, so that's kind of a huge idea to think that you can have it all done by June next year. But but there is a tie-in. 
the component. But so, there is, and I think yeah. as long as you're moving in a direction and you have measurable goals <laughs> met and you're working in a direction, then you know that counts toward the permit. Sure. sure. Uh, the next place is the, the fire station roof. Um, again, kind of just a placeholder number. We're starting to see shingles fall off. The current roof was done when the addition was put on. Um, so you're looking at 20 years plus ago that, that the roof was done. Um, you know, we're not saying it needs to be done tomorrow, but probably in the next three to five years, you're going to need to replace the, the, the roof on the fire station for shingles. And you're believing that 30,000 is going to replace that entire roof? That was the initial numbers that, that we got. Asphalt, of course, not. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, we haven't done a lot of research on that one yet. It's kind of, you know, give that a little bit of a bump, but you know, not talk about okay. the contract. Okay. But we're also talking 25, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the, the last thing outside of vehicles, um, 2015, we bought Scott Air Packs. Um, the gray cylinder that you see there is, has a special DOT exemption that allows us to carry it on the fire trucks without placards, and after 15 years, you can no longer use those. So that is a throwaway piece after 15 years. Uh, currently, it's just under $7,000 per air pack for those, so that would be you know, the requirement to replace the 16 current air packs that we have. Like the gray bottle right there? That has a 15 year lifespan, and we have to have them tested every three years to make sure that they pass. Definitely hydro tested. The pack itself, we get tested uh, just about annually because it has to go through a flow test. So these are all required components that we have to do by NFPA. Uh, that's the other thing that the guy puts on his back before he runs into the building. So there's another. Uh, they used to, I think when we bought those, I don't know, close to nine years ago, they were like. Uh, $5,500 or close to $7,000 a pack now. So we don't have that one on currently on the list either. Correct. Well, no, that's another one that we were, again, looking for the big, big items and we wanted to put that one on board. Last slide. Um, can you just go back when I didn't get that? I want to make sure I get the number down right to 100,000. Can you email all of this to us? Yes. Yeah. You already have it. I know, I yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so vehicles, we were asked to kind of outline all of our vehicles um, so that we're kind of keeping that mindset of when do we need to replace the different vehicles. Um, yeah, we already talked about engine one, it's not on this list because this is the rest of them. Uh, the utility that we have was purchased in uh, 2011, you know, we're already 10 years old on that vehicle. It's a support vehicle, so it's not, you know, as critical, but it does have our backup uh, extrication tools on it. It has water backs. You know, we use it for a lot of equipment that just there's not enough space on the engines for. What would you uh, guess is the mileage on that currently? Round number. I want to say it's like uh, 20, 21. 22,000, somewhere in that range. So it's due to age more than, than actual age. Yes. But it has to be. It's the idle hours. Yeah. Just like our yeah. Yeah. yeah, they can go and sit someplace for six hours just idle. Yeah. 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 And we, we had the accident a couple of weeks ago on the floor and it sat out there for five, six hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does a great job blocking roads when we don't have to have another emergency vehicle. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather for the town to have somebody get that vehicle. <laughs> than a $700,000 fire truck. So, um, and that's a prime example. We had a drunk driver try and go around it. Same yeah. night. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, tank truck. Uh, obviously, last year, we did a lot of work to that. Uh, so that bought us some, some extra time. We're looking at 30 years in 2035 that the that, that tank truck will have been on the road, um, had we not done the major service last year, it would probably be a lot sooner than we needed to replace that. Um, and again, 450,000 seems like a good number now, but depending on how things go over the next you know, 
14 years, they've been <laughs> that, that number could change dramatically. Um, command vehicle. Can I go back to the tank for one sure. minute? Sure. The tank truck does not have a lot of miles. I think it has like 9,000 on it. Um, but last year we had a complete failure of the pump system to that. And there was no money in any of the uh, funds within the community, within the town. So we had to dig into the fire department operating budget to the tune of almost $40,000 to completely replace the pump, all the plumbing, the primer, everything that moves water in that fire truck. So that's in very good shape. Um, the truck itself, again, that's in very good shape too. So that year that we have right there is, is, is flexible. Um, the other issue with the truck is it's also been uh, added to, it runs more than it used to because other communities have uh, asked to have us send that to them a lot more often than we did. So it's getting more used than it did, but it's, it's, it's well equipped to do that. And nowadays, if you see people in fire departments that have tank trucks, our philosophy for that truck is it drives up, it's got three points where it can discharge water, it's empty in five minutes, it goes and finds a hydrant and fills again. That's how we do it. It's a nurse truck. It's made to dump water and go. Um, a lot of what fire departments are doing now is they're taking that same kind of truck, but they're putting a cab on it. They're putting five guys in it. They use it as a fire truck. My, my philosophy is a little bit different because these things are enormous and they can't get them in a lot of places. So I think we get the best bang for the buck with that truck. The turning radius isn't real good. But when we go to a fire and there's six tank trucks running around, that one there is running more often. It's more efficient. It gets the water to the scene a lot better. So um, again, by ISO rating, that's something we need to have in the town. It makes a big difference for us as far as our delivery of water, because that's got 3,000. The new engine's got 750, and then 15 in the old one. So we can deliver a lot of water on wheels right away, uh, which, which we need to do. The, the reason we have that tank truck is because over half the town doesn't have so hydrants. Have no water. So, uh, the, the command vehicle, 10 years old, uh, that actually probably gets the most mileage because we run it around town for errands. Uh, when people are in classes, they have the ability to take it. Uh, it goes, it's, you know, it's our command vehicle, it's got radios in it for you know, any incident that we have. One of the chiefs can use that um, you know, as a central point of command. Um, and then you know, beyond that, engine two, again, relatively new. This is 20 years after the purchase date. Um, and then the forestry you know, that we just got last year, um, 20 years on that as well. I can send you this, the PowerPoint. I also put together just a Word doc that lists them all out with the year, just a quick bullet on each of them, just so you have that. Okay. And anybody else have questions on this? this was yeah, it's a great presentation. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. 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 Very thorough. Thank you. That's what we tried to do. Again, well, there were some additions to that because we sat down and looked at it and we understand what town needs, what you guys are asking for. So we basically went through and said, anything that's a real thing to take out and pick up this ball and include it. So I think just to maybe to make sure I get the information right, because I'm, I'm going to be taking over the, the, the spreadsheet for the capital projects. So I took a lot of notes. I'll probably update your sections, and I'll send them to you. It'd be nice to have you guys just double check and make sure I didn't mistype something, didn't misunderstand something. Really the same for the police department, too. Right? So do well. Okay. Thank you for coming up with us so quickly. It helps us. I know it was you know, we didn't get much lead time, but we appreciate that. Thank you. But we always
coming, so we would do the work on it for a couple of weeks, trying to make sure we got it all in the news. But the other night we were calling and said, Sean, guess what? <laughs> we had a couple of things that I thought of. So, because we are busy. I mean, last last few years we've been in the area of 150, 180 calls. We're already at that number. We're not even three quarters through the year. So we're going to be way above where we normally are. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Figuring out where to put the money in each year, I think you were going to work on that. Yeah, I, I think Carol and I are going to spend a little time after this. Just I had some questions. I reviewed what the sheet was, trying yeah. to understand all the things that are coming out from all over. <coughs> yeah, well, we heard that the that the um, body cameras. I mean, that's something that there's a strong consensus, at least on that. And I know we have to make the decision. Yeah, but that's a real pending thing. The uh, <coughs> the roof at the transfer. I mean, at the highway, that's a pretty pending thing, but we still have to think about whether we're going metal, steel, or doing half, all. Um, and then, of course, with the generator, at least that's two years out. That's something we doesn't have to all be funded in one year. We could fund that half each year. Yeah. Um, so there's some decisions to be made there. The, the other thing is, is with, for example, the body cameras, that assumes that the select board wants to support the operating right. budget sure. that would be required to support that, not just in the first year, but in an ongoing way. Yeah, so be an addition there, yeah. Yeah, yeah I so. I would put snacks on this year, or this year. I think so, absolutely, because there's, there's money there. Money. Um, it concerns me not to do it, though. That's mm -hmm. just the one thing. The way the world's going, you know, and what, how expensive lawsuits can be. I, I, I agree with you. I'm more compelled, though, by aging firearms and the physical hazard of carrying firearms that are so out of date that with with all the elements in use that that they get that they're that old I you know that that's a physical you know it, it's hard to weigh a, a physical hazard versus a life is the liability hazard because they're in the end they're both a hazard they're just different um, yeah I would love to see body cameras happen in the operating budget this year carry in the operating going forward and do firearms next year. But that doesn't, you know, we can't, you know, I, I don't know if this Well, it's going to be a mutual decision, mutual discussions, you know. Um, I differ a little bit from what you're saying about the firearms, you know, I mean, as far as the you know, priority of firearms versus body cameras, um, I do think there's a need to replace the firearms. I, I mean, what we purchase is also a quality firearm, you know, being that it's a Glock, it's, you know, it's a very well made. It's, it sees a lot of use. It's not something that sits on a guy's waist for 16 years and then it has to fire tonight right now. You know, it's something that's regularly being used in service. And, um, but we differ that way. And, that, and that's, that's completely acceptable. And, you know, I'm not saying I'm I really think it's right. So, I mean, I, I have a, a lot of notes and Caroline has sent me the sheet that she made some updates. I think I have enough to probably go back and, I think there are two steps for me here. One is to make sure that what the sheet has is representative of what we've heard over the past couple of days. I think I have a pretty good start on that. So I can do that first pass, send it to people and say, not really Joe, you missed this thing. So we can do that, we can do that. And then I think the second item, which doesn't have to be done before the select board, um, is, is maybe I could take a crack at making it a little bit more manageable as far as a tool to manage things that are expenses and things that are capital improvement items. And 
that to me is probably a, a, a second pass. But so the first piece, if I do all of those changes, do is the process that this group goes to the select board and says, here's what they're looking for? It's, it's not so much this group as much as the decision of this group. And okay. maybe you or I or some other representative of this group presenting to the select board. These are, this was the discussion, this is what we heard, right. and this is our suggestion to you. Okay. So I think it is first pass is for, for me to, to get this to a position that I think represents everything that I heard. Mm -hmm. And then for people to, to do a, a double check on that. So this spreadsheet being in, in a um, representative um, form, as you're, as you're saying, is the ultimate goal and needs to happen um, you know, by January for inclusion in the town report. Mm -hmm. And when I say January, that means that um, the select board has to also have decided that they agree with the allocations and the years and, and the whole thing. Right. So, so there's some time there. Um, what there's less time about is the sense of we heard from people about what they think their needs are for 2022, and we also have this 60. This is this one that I printed for you tonight is an updated one that shows the 64,851 that needs to be allocated to projects. Mm -hmm. So even having some kind of conversation about um, do we agree with the years that the department heads are presenting or do we think that given the priority in one department something else has to wait, um, do we want to use that 64000 mostly to do something unexpected, split it pretty evenly over the 2022 proposals or spread, spread it evenly over you know, something over the 10 year lifespan. So, so there are like ways, like different ways that you can allocate the $68,000, understanding of course that the select board can change it. But I think more immediately for the, you know, so that we can benefit from Miles's input is um, if we feel we can do it without looking at a complete rehab of the spreadsheet, what is our feeling about 2022? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. that. Sixty-eight thousand has to be spent by. It doesn't have to be spent by. It's just about how there's money in this fund, and this fund represents these projects that we plan on purchasing on, on whatever year. So the sixty-eight thousand dollars should be put toward a certain project. But if it was set aside for a specific intent, specific purpose, we can decide to change, take it away from that. that set that's aside? not. Um, Yes, we could, but that's not what I'm suggesting. Um, so it's not clear what these, what project the $64,000 was allocated toward because for all of the things that were purchased in 2022, I took all of the money and I allocated those, you know. So, so this could just be interest in the bank account. It's, it's, it's more than that because it's kind of a lot of money, but I can't tell you what project it was intended for. Otherwise, uh, of course, I know what it is. What? Oh, please. <laughs> the project didn't happen. Because the articulating loader used oh. to cost a hundred thousand dollars. Yes, and now it's fifty. Price oh, right. That's it. And, yeah. and George came with a different piece of equipment. Right. I think that's. The I think you're quite right. So in that case, it doesn't really have an intent, and we can. Right. Because we've already satisfied the intent that right. it's been set for with buying it. For less money. For less money. Yep. Okay. Yep. So is that something we want to decide tonight? What we, what our, I mean, because granted, adjusting years outside of 2022 is something we're going to revisit again a year from now. It really doesn't matter. So what really matters is that 2022 call. That's really, really what matters. Well, well, also, you know, um, is there something that they're saying can wait that we think is for whatever reason, um, worthwhile to do in 2022, either to avoid maintenance costs or for a safety concern, um, or because maybe there's otherwise not a lot to be purchased in 2022, and we have that $64,000, we, we, we can take something that somebody put down for a different year and say, let's do that in 2022 also, or instead of. So where do we think we're at for, for 22? So we've got 
So we have the body cameras, the vehicle exhaust system. The body cameras are going to come off this and come out of. Well, well, we can we can suggest that okay. to the select board that there's funding and that they should use it in that way to avoid the expense here, but we can't assure that. Right. So, okay. so I, I would say if we want that to get purchased, we can say to the select board, we hope it will come out of operating in 2021. Otherwise, we hope you will put it on as a Warren article CIP funded in 2022. Okay. Understanding that it changes the funding because you either have to allocate funding for it from CIP or else if it comes from operating that allows you more money to do something else instead. Yep. Okay. But there's also the, the additional piece of the increase to budget for the storage. Well, cost. right. That's, so that's, so that's, that's what I'm talking to John that about. Budget, that yeah. John needs to present two different budgets. Yeah. Um, I hope you do body cameras. This is the associated budget. Otherwise, if not, this is what I would otherwise suggest. For budget. That's an increase that's going to be continued. That's, that's just going to go forward. Right. It's always going to be a piece added to the budget. Yep. Right. So we have body cameras, if not sooner, and then the vehicle exhaust system, vehicle wash area. But the vehicle wash area we decided was probably not going to be a CIP hub. That's true. And then the highway department roof. I would really possibly push that out only because I feel like, okay, so yes, we know that it routinely needs repairs, but I don't think we have enough information to say we should do the front, the back, metal, asphalt. Like, I just feel like there's a lot of unknowns with that to be able to suggest. I don't think we have a firm enough number, I guess. I support Miles say, saying that. I, I'm in no way shape to decide whether it's even going to be 48 or 150. I need to, I need to see more information, you know. Yeah, and um, I know it's something we're continually spending money on each year fixing, but um, there's some other things that were brought to light that I think are a little more important. Okay, so, so that being said, then um, I think it's really valid for this group to decide what do you want to propose for 2022 to the select board, and then there's nothing to say this group can't continue to meet once or twice more to decide that you agree on the payment plan, the allocation of $68,000, dollars $64,000, um, and, and where does the roof go, and right. what are we doing for a roof, and all those things. So getting back to what we're looking at for 2022, we originally started out. Body cam. We were talking about body cam, and, and the vehicle exhaust, but we're moving the wash station. But then on the generator, is that something we'd be looking at maybe doing half each year? If that's a 23 project, we'd be looking at putting 22,000 for the next two years? Is, that's something, or, or do we feel that that's an item that could maybe be pushed out further? I don't know. You know. Yeah, I mean, it is one of those things you could push it out forever and have it not be an issue. Well, or a and single so, year, just yeah. another single yeah. year. I don't know. I guess, and that's the tough part is not seeing the numbers to see what we're proposing for a bottom line of what needs to be funded Indeed. to CIV. Yes. That's the tough part. Yeah. You know, I've got strong feelings, um, you know. And if we're not looking at the roof this year. Well, then the, the guns become a lot more dear to me, you know, because I was thinking, you know, anywhere from 50 to 150 for that roof. If that's something we're considering pushing out, then I would certainly think more about the guns. Okay, so if we're going to talk about um, guns and even body cameras being equipment, it's important to know that there's $38,000 in that fund. Current. So, currently. So that's money you can buy something with next year, but let that also inform how much do we need to put away to keep that fund self-sustaining for whatever we think it's going to fund. And that 38000 is in a fund to be used just for police department? No, it is a new equipment fund. So it can Town buy... Wide. Yes. Yeah, okay. There was already some money in there, and then last year we funded 13000 Seven. We put seven, seven in it. Um, but we, we, yeah. we, nothing says we have to exhaust that account. No, nor should we, I think, although we could, but I think just like separate and apart from the CIP, what is the plan with that fund? What is all the equipment that we're going to try to maintain or, you know, or replace regularly with that fund? What does it cost? What, is the what are the purchase years? Like, like, like we have still kind of 
an enormous feat in front of us, I think. Yeah, what, what's the total about the current actual It's $38,000. $38,000, and that includes the seven grand from the last from, year. From, that was funded in this current year. That was approved in 2021. That includes that. 38 yes. is the total. Um, yeah. Plus whatever, you know, pennies of, of yeah. interest or whatever. Yes. Right. Right. But that's also, the same you know, the guns is not as big a ticket item as some things. They're, they're 15000 versus... 25,000. In, in the guns, you spend it and you own it. That's not cameras where you spend it and then you have to support it, you know, with the, with the storage. Um, and that is, once again, life safety. I would never want an officer not to have a, a fully dependable gun. So yeah. to that, with the source, should we be having a code here that indicates new equipment fund? In other words, so we, we have something that's capital improvement. We have an E for... So that's equipment. what the E is for equipment, or C for capital. Okay, and, so and e, e, is, e is orange to be like more visible, but, yeah. but I really think we ought to pull all those items out and, and sort of extend the CIP separately so that you can have a it's sort of a subtotal of CIP I, I and then agree. a separate... Yeah. That's why I yeah. have a bunch of yeah. questions. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay, so... Anything that's here as an E, the thought behind it was that it was going to be funded by the new equipment trust fund? Correct. Okay. Yep. And so from a standpoint of what this sheet should look like, we should have, well, maybe that's too much for the, maybe that's what I was saying, I would say like a second task, which would be to kind of get this a little clearer versus making it a document that we can at least make a decision on for 2022. Yeah, and um, it, it's a funny thing, equipment, because I think equipment is typically, though not always, less expensive. That you know, um, like a singular item might cost two to five thousand dollars, but we want to buy ten or fifteen of them, so it makes it a larger item. So it, it's also a question of trying to push things into the operating budget versus the benefit of larger scale purchases and trade-ins. Right. So so managing that on a plan is just an extra So is there a third source here then? So you have capital improvement, you have equipment, and then you say operating budget. And we want to have it on here because it's an operating budget item, but it is an asset that we yeah. want to track. So so code it oh yeah. yeah. That's what I mean. So okay. And then I think there's a fourth which is the ARPA funds. Because we don't want to lose track yeah. of the uh, ideas. The ideas here, yeah. right? Um, That's that American yep. rescue plan. Rescue plan. Okay. Maybe not. So, are are we? Um, is there any any other thoughts about? Is this body cameras? Hoping for this year, if not next, and then vehicle exhaust, and then maybe firearms for the sake of a third thing and try to keep things moving. Mm -hmm. The benefit of doing less in purchasing in one single year means that if we are doing an equal or greater payment, um, we're, we're getting a little bit more ahead in the plan financially because we've been draining more than we're putting in lately, or, or you know, draining a lot relative to what we're putting in. But also on the, getting back to the vehicle exhaust systems, there's, there's thirty thousand set aside right now for that. Is that correct? Yes. So the balance is not twenty; it's forty-five thousand. So, so correct. It's thirty-five because it's costing fifteen thousand more than we thought. So instead of needing to come up with another twenty, okay, we need to come up with another thirty-five. 35. Mm, I think it's forty-five. Well, um, because we have well, already. you're right because you've got that future. It says future year you've got ten. So yes, it's forty-five. Okay, I never understood the future year. I'm gonna. I didn't. Either. So so what it means? You have to be plugged in. I'm guessing. It's a. It's this is not my language. This is somebody else's spreadsheet. But it means the ten. So um, the gross capital cost that first large dollar amount you're looking at. Yep. Um, then you've got the ten-year span of funding. Yep. So that gross capital cost minus what you put away for 10 years equals what you need to come up with in future years. 
in other words, hopefully zero, okay. or how much you're not making a payment for. So it helps you to reallocate those 10 years so that you get to zero. So the difference, basically, if we use the vehicle exhaust system, that 10,000 is the difference between total for 10 year period and SIP reserve fund? Well, that's something well, we've had to plug true. in in the years that, true, so that are all zeros. That's something we've so, got to plug in there at some point. So say, for example, we were going to make the vehicle exhaust system a purchase of 2032. In other words, the first year after this plan, um, you know, in, in the future, 10 years from now. So you put $1,000 per year away to pay for this. Um, that's going to take care of the $10,000 for future years, and you'll be fully funded at, at the old price of $60,000. So, so in other words, how you manage what you're putting away over those 10 years calculates into that, you know, the 10 years minus what you have as the gross capital cost equals what you still have to come up with. So it's trying to show you that you are or are not accomplishing the goal of fully funding it. It also helps when you're looking in the spreadsheet and you can see the formulas. Yeah, that was one column I didn't look at. I didn't scroll. But now I, I see as you go down here. So basically, the formula must be take the total for 10 year period plus the SIP reserve fund, subtract it from your gross capital cost, and that gives you yeah. the future years. Of yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Future years outside of the 31 that this plan expires. Right. Yes. It, or or really a like, it's so, a shortfall. So really. It's a shortfall <laughs> unless your your purchase year is like in the, in year thirty four or something right. like that. Yeah. In which case it may not be a shortfall. Right. Yeah. So really, the future years other sources is a better term would be shortfalls. It could be. It could be. Well, but just be careful of that because you've got fire trucks with a twenty year lifespan. So your funding for future years might yeah. just represent years that haven't happened that you do intend to fund. Well, I was also wondering about, are we, take the fire truck, this is one of the questions that came up when they, they were talking about. We know in 20 years we're going to have to replace the fire truck. Do we actually set aside that each time, or when do we really need it, we bond it, and then it becomes a payment from that point forward? So this plan was created in 2014, and we've tried to put everything on it, but that means that we're trying to fund it too quickly, and we don't want the voters to say, hey, this is crazy expensive and doesn't make sense. Right. So we tried to moderate that, and for the last several years had the conversation, do we want to fund it actually? and risk that with the voters? Or do we want to recognize that the next fire truck purchase will be bonded because there's no way to otherwise adequately fund this program and yeah. likely have it pass the voters? So I mean, it, it is almost like there's a certain amount that at some point it should just be bound, it should be bonded. Unless it's something, well, even if we're going to, if something said we need a new fire truck tomorrow, it's going to be bound, uh, bonded, and you're going to have to make that um, yearly amount that's going to start in, let's say, 2022, part of the overall operating budget for the fire department. And that's really the same as if you say the fire department's going to need something in 2030 or 2035. Do we, do we also, do we want to start putting that money away and, and thinking that we have it, or do we just say, come 2035, we're going to bond it. The thing has a 30-year well, life, and we're going to... So, so that's a funny thing. I would say the goal should always be to put money away so that you're not borrowing because borrowing costs money. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we will have just, you know, very soon we're going to have to bond a, a fire truck, which means you have a payment. So yeah. you have a payment for 15 years into the future. At the same time, you're trying to create this other payment to pay for the fire truck that you don't yet have. Almost so, like a down payment. So it's, it's, you yeah. know, so I think unless you sacrifice significantly in the operating budget or or there is like like some really new public understanding around the goal and a lack of will for borrowing you know th that's a really difficult sell to be doing a payment while you're also putting away money while you have all these other needs going on right so do we i mean is the point then we do 
we do zero and we bond it when it's needed, or do we do 100% so it's zero when we need it, or do we do enough of a, of a, of a down payment collection so that when we bond it, it's, it's, it's not much of an impact on the operating budget? So, so the last iteration of this was, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was, was created such that that one first fire truck was bonded but that the goal would be to fund everything appropriately so that you don't have to come up with cash in the purchase year for okay. that item. Okay. All right. so However, that's... you've got to watch the bottom line to make sure that um, you know, you're not doing this yes. with what you're asking for from the town um, and that you're not asking for twice, double the payment next year than we asked for this year. Like, like how do we get to that sweet spot payment that we need to, to be okay in that in that purchase year. Well, I, I, th I thought you're saying that we want to be in a position that anything that when it is finally needed, enough money, it's almost like a, a Christmas card account which we don't yes. lose anymore. Yes. That there's enough money somewhere. But so, so the problem is, if you look at 22, the year 2022, the way payments are currently allocated, you know, we need to ask the town, the voters, for two hundred thirty-seven thousand yeah. dollars. That's a, that assumes that we actually have all our allocations correct, which mm -hmm. is I, I'm not confident in that. So I'm not confident in that number. But but let's check that number. So we just asked the voters this year for two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So maybe we can ask the voters for two hundred uh, two thirty-seven in this upcoming year. I, I guess that's part of the question. If you can put, um, and, and it depends on what's going on in the operating budget. So, so yes, that's the goal, okay. but, it, but is it achievable with the voters? You, you have to keep in mind, you know, ultimately, you don't want it to fail. Like, because it's, it, it's better to underfund the fund by $30,000 than to have the whole $230,000 payment Fail. So if we make this number look, you might not like the number, but this is the number. That's the planning item. And then the select board has to decide, well, we have all these other things that are out of whack that we can't really do the 300. Let's say the average of all these numbers says you need 250 grand a year in order to put into the reserve fund. Well, we can't do 250 a year. We can only do 230. Maybe next year we can make it up. Maybe we can't. Maybe we have to cut some things. But the select board would make a, a decision that we're just going to ask for 200000 because it's going to make too big of a change in the tax rate. For this. And that's what happened in 2021. Okay. And that's this why group, 200. Yes, this group proposed some number bigger than 200 and the select okay. board said, with everything else, okay. no. Okay. So it's, it sounds like this has to be as realistic as possible based on everything that people have come in with. And that these numbers at the bottom are going to be whatever they are. You might not like them, but this is what they are, and this is how they add up. I would say that's the that's the if you could get us that far, that would be really helpful. And then this group can meet and, and look at the spreadsheet and say, what do we do now? Like because we're looking at a four hundred thousand dollar payment next year. You know, do we want to change purchase years? Or you know, pay partially right. in cash or something, or or I don't know what. Right, right. But it's just a proposal to the select board. The select yeah. board is, can still have yeah. you know bottom line decision making. Yeah, but I think it's a need like we were talking about. Just the the information has to be honest and transparent. Yeah. And then you know, agree. <laughs> you can just do whatever, whatever yeah. else you do in government, right? We just we don't like it before. <laughs> <See, laughs> we're not going to do it. <laughs> But um, all right, I think I, I I think I have enough here to at least, and I'm gonna like I said at the beginning, I'll, I'll stay away from making it look as if I were if I had started it, and and just do it as a way. I think I understand the format. I do have some questions for you, just trying to understand where all the pieces come in. But um, I think I have enough of an understanding to take a crack at it, make sure the formulas add up all over the place, that these numbers are right. And then we can send it out and whether we want to get together again, you know, next week or something like that, or 
kind of miles if you're, if you're going to Tahiti or something? I'm, uh, I'm retired. <laughs> um, I mean, we could ask the select board if they would. I don't know if they can appoint me as ex officio if I'm not. Not Why as an ex officio, but <laughs> well, as a resident member. Resident. Yeah. You know. But that's not the makeup of the. No, it's not. So. Let's see. You want to be on the budget committee? <laughs> you can add you to the budget committee. You know. then you can go. You know that. I had like miles to the. Okay, you done. You done. Could I interest you in the school board? <laughs> school board. <laughs> okay, we can plug you in somewhere. Yeah. There's a spot. School board might be less, more than. I mean, because your last select board. Your no. last day on the select board is tomorrow, so it's not going to happen. Right. This isn't going to happen by. No. Tomorrow. No. No, so more work. Yeah. Well, but it sounds like we've come to a pretty easy conclusion about what the proposal is for purchases for 2020. I think the discussion is done. If we, if we all see the same sheet and can send an email, I agree with this. My thought is this. You, I think we can solve it through yeah. communication that way. I mean, well, there's a so group. we can't communicate via email. You know, he can he can send that out via email and say, have oh, a look at this to be prepared for discussion. But you can't say, I mean, you, you you got to be really careful not to have back and forth via email because that's a meeting outside of a meeting. Mm -hmm. Well, that's I could receive I, corrections, Joey. But it should have been a three instead of a four. Yes, that's but nice. there is no opportunity for approval. Yes, right. I'm good for that because right. you know that's then you've got that. voting outside of a meeting too. So, so essentially, so what we, we do it. have to meet again, I would say, to um, look over the final version and you know say that's good and it makes sense. But I think. Joe, if um, can we meet without a select board representative? I can. Can you serve that? I can ask the board how they feel about it. That's that's what I would say. I don't I don't think that there is any requirement, and I don't know that I can't fulfill that function. But I don't know that that's. Well, I wouldn't CIP, say automatically. Are they required to have the town administrator here? I wouldn't say required. I would say it's a good idea. I think but it's very good idea. What I'm saying is, I don't think it's required. I mean, you couldn't fill two roles. If we need representation from the select board, if you're if you're wearing that hat, you could be ex officio for the select board. Um, mm -hmm. I think I don't know. Like I don't know that there is a statutory that there's statutory guidance on that one way or the other. So I would I, I would leave that to the select board to decide that they want to participate or they want to delegate the rest of the process to me. I mean, the, the function of this committee is just making a suggestion to the select board. That's our task. Well, and, and to my mind... That is mind, our task. That's well, all our task. We don't, we, don't, we don't make the decision on what actually goes. The select board does. Well, right. So We're just advising. Not, you're not even you anymore. Yes. We're yeah. just advising. We're just making well, a suggestion. But but this group typically also manages the spreadsheet, which then the select board can modify. So to my mind, the that goal of this committee has been accomplished, that we've decided what is to be proposed for 2022. So, but is there any statutes or RSAs that we're bound by that says that, I mean, we're just, our, our, our task is making a select suggestion after hearing from the department heads. That's really what this what this meeting does. It meets just for the sole purpose of making that suggestion to the select board. Um, I I wouldn't be quite as narrow about that. I think this group's function is about managing this plan. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about meeting as many times as is necessary to keep this plan up to date and in working order, which includes making a recommendation for next year purchases mm -hmm. so well there are requirements because the planning budget school i mean there had to be representation from other boards select board so so i don't think there's a school requirement we include them just okay. because we ought to have more continuity and, and talk more and be on the same page about plans particularly with really large expenses mm -hmm. you know 2022 looks like it might be a more reasonable year for the voters to consider a ventilation system at the school since there's not quite as much happening on the capital side here, although that's separate and apart from what might be happening on the operating budgets for each of those. But she's also privy to what the town's spending because she spent the time here. She's, she's heard our discussions, so she's going well, back to that knowledge. Well, sure, but the whole that. operating conversation hasn't happened with the select board of departments yet. So 
So, so there are lots of moving parts, but it at least helps for some continuity and sharing of information. But as far as as the as the laws go around CIP, um, and I I haven't read them recently, but it is primary. It's a planning document, which is why it's really technically ruled by the planning board. Um, but the select board. Um, does certainly have a role because they propose or don't propose whatever the suggestions are. But as a planning document, it's under the purview of the planning board. So from what I'm hearing, it, it doesn't sound like we'd be any violation, but for the just the four of us <coughs> to meet one more time. Oh, yeah, I don't think. I don't think there's any violation to to, to finalize our decisions because we did get input from ex officio. We did get input from ex officio. Like deliberations, and now it's just the final decision making. In which case, I mean, the select board can choose to send a representative. I, I would still so so. I agree with you that I don't think it's breaking any laws. Right. At the same time, because of how we have consistently operated in the past, I wouldn't want to speak for the board and decide that it's okay for Miles to sit in in their stead for one more meeting just yeah. because no. they have the right to want one of them or a new member to do that instead. But I, I didn't so, think that was the avenue we were pursuing. The avenue I thought we were pursuing was you representing select board. Uh, again, still though, but that's possibly, a but I, I, I don't want to make that unilateral decision. Yeah. yeah. Even though I don't think there's a problem with that, I, I still think it would be their decision to make. I'm, I'm fine with meeting one more time. Absolutely. Whenever, just as long as it's in the evening. Okay. Um, CIP is one of the earlier things on the Budget Committee's draft schedule. So the Budget Committee drafted it a schedule of when they're hoping to hear from department heads, including CIP. Um, the select board has revised that schedule, and I've sent it back to John Ordway. And I don't know that he's shared it with the BC or not. So um, as according to that schedule, again, draft form, um, CIP is being presented to the budget committee in late uh, very end of September um, in the first meeting with Highway. So the select board is hoping to hear budget presentations from department heads either this Monday the 23rd or the following Monday the 30th. So I'm wondering what this group, including Joe, thinks about asking Joe to come to a select board meeting on either Monday or the 30th to talk about, you know, a brief synopsis of this process so far and the um, proposals for purchase for 2022. Is there slightly the point there? Yes. And the 30th, 30th was set aside for budget. For, for the remainder of the budget, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not available the 23rd. Okay. Are you, are you, I don't mean to put you on the spot and you're already managing the spreadsheet. Um, is, is that okay and are you willing to do that and do we feel like, yeah. you know? I mean, I would hope for what I, I mean, I'll work on this over the weekend, at least by. And, and feel free to send it back and forth to me oh, and we can call and talk about it. And yes. Um, I'll try to get something to you on Monday, okay. Tuesday at the latest. Okay. The, I'm, I'm not available. I'm not available Monday night. That's it. And that's okay. when the select board meets. But during the day, it should be okay. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Is that it? Yeah. I just wanted to spend a few minutes okay. with you trying to sure. get us some questions on this. All right. Miles, your last meeting. 
That's it. That's Coming to a close. Thank you, sir. And, and according to some people, they think I should be banned from ever running for an office again. Um, so you won't, you won't see me around here anymore. Don't do bus it with something. Don't do bus with something. Banned. Okay. Stay off Rollins from happening. Yeah, that's good. Stay off Rollins from happening. Exiting altogether. It's just such a pile of. Cool. But I, I find it entertaining sometimes. Entertaining. Well, it's for the highest safety. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because you take it in their comments seriously. Yeah. Just treat it as entertainment. It's entertainment. It, 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 it crosses into personal. That's something.